You sit down. You put in the Blu-ray. You get comfortable and think to yourself, what the hell, I'll just rewatch the Jurassic Park series. <laughs> With the upcoming release of Jurassic World Dominion this June, I thought what better time than now to revisit the Jurassic Park slash World franchise. This series has played an important role in my life, and to a lesser extent this channel. From the introduction to my favorite dinosaur of all time, to the great themes and ideas that the first film explores, to the staple of cinema that the first one has also become. And the other ones that exist. Dr. Grant. My dear Dr. Sattler, welcome to Jurassic Park. I'm going to be completely honest with you, dear viewer. This movie is easily in my top 10 movies of all time, and I don't say that lightly at all. This film does so much right. Honestly, the dinosaur aspect of it is still great, but it's even better when every scene involving them is used to present and explore the themes of the movie, and not just big monster action scenes go burr unlike pretty much all the other action scenes in later movies. The two main themes that are talked a lot about in this franchise but have only been done effectively in this film, and the first being that these are just animals. Even scenes like the T-Rex breaking out of its paddock is more just like predator behavior with a mixture of curiosity, and not just a mindless killing machine. While the idea that the dinosaurs are just animals isn't the main focus of the film, it's a critical part of the idea behind the major theme, and that being that the power of nature. And as Ian Malcolm so wonderfully puts it, John, the kind of control you're attempting is, uh, it's not possible. Listen, if there's one thing the history of evolution has taught us, it's that life will not be contained. Life breaks free, it expands to new territories, and it crashes through barriers painfully, maybe even dangerously, but, uh, well, there it is. Michael Crichton's ideas from the book are translated almost perfectly in here, and part of that probably has to do with the fact that he helped write the screenplay, meaning that the finer, more subtle, but equally important details of the book weren't skipped out on. The film, while mentioning it once, instead always shows us that humankind cannot control nature, and any attempts to do so, no matter how much it appears that we have control, that that's always part of the illusion, that we had control over it in the first place. And to go back to what Ian Malcolm said, it will eventually break out, sometimes even dangerously. Even the circumstances of how the dinosaurs break out isn't completely due to human incompetence. <coughs> it's because of the hurricane that took place while at the same time Nedry temporarily turned off the power to the entire park. Unlike many modern movies nowadays, as well as you'll see me discuss in the later movies of the franchise, Jurassic Park doesn't cave your skull in trying to hammer its message, because a well-written, good movie doesn't have to keep doing that. If a film handles its themes and messages well, then it'll naturally stick with you even after watching the film. In addition to a great theme to help add the extra oomph into the narrative that helps make this an excellent film, however, making good use of your theme into your story isn't really enough to earn you the legendary status this film has acquired. All the characters, while not the deepest characters ever, are written as actual human beings with personalities and natural interactions and dialogue exchanges with one another, which makes all the characters likable. Heck, even the kids are extremely good, which is few and far between in pop culture nowadays. On the technical side, this film for the most part holds up, with maybe the exception of some of the CGI, but the camera angles and other filming techniques have become iconic at this point and really help cement this as a staple of cinema. Seriously, ladies and gents, even if you just watched this movie recently, go watch it again. This film isn't just audience hype, it's the real deal. Well, after such a great movie, surely the sequel would be a pretty good film too, right? Right? Alright, I'll be nice-ish to the film first. Plot-wise, this film is fine. InGen wants to take the dinosaurs off Isla Sorna to a new park in San Diego, which apparently was almost done with construction, so it kind of makes you wonder why Hammond didn't have the park there. Probably less of the US government breathing down his back or something like that. But then why would they be allowed to do it now since there's evidence of the park going wrong before on an isolated area? So bringing it to the mainland wouldn't make any Dinosaur action-wise, there are some neat scenes like the shot of the velociraptors in the tall grass and the rampage through San Diego were fun and entertaining, 
and the dinosaur designs are pretty good. I especially like the different coloration that they use for quite a few of them. Uh, what else can I say? Um, I like Eddie. He's the only one in the main group that I did like and ended up sacrificing himself to save the others. Uh, while dorky looking, he is a chat, especially compared to the Virgin Nick. Okay, that's it. I'm done being nice to this film. I gave it some compliments, but now I'm done. This is where the fun begins. The characters here are just horrible. I guess start with the least worst and go from there. And I would have to place probably Ian Malcolm as the least worst. The main complaint is that all his lines seem to just be the same thing, and that being, I'm right, you're wrong. Regardless if he's right, which he is, he also seems to lack that charismatic energy that made him so popular in the first film. Next comes his daughter, which, if I'm being honest, she is just pointless to the story. Heck, she's not even present in the finale. Say what you will about the other characters, but at least they are still critical for the plot of the film to play out. On the plus side, she's not really annoying like many kid characters, although she does have among one of the stupidest moments in the franchise, putting it right up there with Camp Cretaceous Season 4 and Fallen Kingdom. I don't know how much cocaine Spielberg was on when they decided to film the gymnastics scene, but it was probably too much. Hasn't he heard that sharing is caring? Now we move on to the real gems, and by gems, I mean the kidney stones that you have to push out as they tear you apart from the inside. Mr. Cool Man, Nick Van Owen. I have never seen a character try and act so cool while not being that more than Nick. I mean, you can't have a guy like this say lines like, In case they weren't, he did send a backup plan. What backup plan? Me. This guy also risks people's lives by taking out the shells of a hunter because man bad, nature good. Which kind of loses its merit when you need something to defend yourself on an island full of dinosaurs. Now we get to the creme de la creme of bad characters. And you may be thinking, the bad guy, right? The evil businessman guy, right? <laughs> No, if you haven't put two and two together, the worst character is Sarah Harding, by a landslide. Is she really that bad, you may be asking? Yes. Sarah Harding is a hypocritical idiot that is responsible for two direct deaths and many indirect deaths in this film. So let's go through the list of stupidity committed by this moron, shall we? In the film, she states that T-Rexes have one of the strongest senses of smell, so you can't really blame ignorance on her case. No, no, you're wrong there, Dr. Harding. We'll lose them once we leave their territory. No, don't bet on it. Tyrannosaurus got the largest proportional olfactory cavity of any creature in the fossil record with the exception of one. She also has a jacket covered in the blood of the baby T-Rex when they were fixing its broken leg. Even when one of the hunters brings it up with her, she does nothing about it. Well, surprise, surprise, the bucking doe comes sniffing around camp to investigate. Oh, don't bet on it. Tyrannosaurus got the largest proportional olfactory cavity of any creature in the fossil record with the exception of one. And you can't blame the one guy that starts screaming because I'd be willing to bet that most of you would probably scream if you briefly woke up for a moment and found a T-Rex in your campsite. <laughs> Not enough evidence for you? Fine, I'll provide more. When we first meet her, she goes up to pet a baby stegosaurus, but the scene after the stegosaurus go crazy and attack her, she says this. I don't like that. Dinosaurs can pick up scents from miles away. We're here to observe and document, not interact. Uh. Mm. We're here to observe and document, not interact. Mm. We're here to observe and document. Shut up! Just shut up, you idiot! Your Honor, a final point I'd like to make is while fixing said baby Tyrannosaur leg, Ian tries calling the trailer they are at in order to let them know that mommy's very angry and that the parents are on their way. Nick even tries to get the phone as it's ringing, but Sarah calls him back to put pressure on the leg. We have no idea what his metabolism is. We'll kill him with too much. We'll put him into respiratory arrest. Nick, I need your hand here. Right here, put some pressure there. You are on an island full of dinosaurs. That phone call, and I know I'm gonna sound crazy on this one guys, but please bear with me, might, just might be 
important to your safety. Sarah is the MJ of this movie. If you've ever seen the OG Spider-Man movies, then you know what I'm talking about. A few other notable stupid moments include the Jack Horner lookalike being eaten by the T-Rex he somehow forgot was right in front of his face when he sees a snake. I don't think anything could make you forget about the giant T-Rex head a foot away from your face roaring and trying to eat you. Also the plot points about how the boat crew was somehow killed by the T-Rex but the hand was still somehow holding on to the remote in the cargo door so somehow the T-Rex got out, killed everyone, and then somehow locked itself back into the cargo bin? Okay. I'll end on a high-ish note relating to this movie. The main hunter, Roland, is a decent enough character in the sense that his goal is admirable, and he's one of the only people in the film with more than two brain cells. And the reason why he leaves and is absent from the finale is for a logical reason that any normal person would probably leave, that being so much death. Now we move on to the almost universally hated movie of the franchise, that being Jurassic Park 3. Which while being a terrible film, I think The Lost World and Fallen Kingdom are still much worse, and here's why. Each of those respected movies are for starters both bad, but the way that they both present themselves is that they have this kind of moral high ground and that they are trying to be on the same level as the first film which is like trying to compare a first grader that can run fast to Usain Bolt. If you want to be a big dumb monster movie, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we're going to try and play off as a great movie with some deep themes and great characters, then I'm going to judge you as such. Hence why I have such a disdain for those two films. And trust me, I'll get the Fallen Kingdom in a minute. Contrast those two films to Jurassic Park 3, which is relatively short at just pushing in at 92 minutes with credits. It's a bad movie, but it kind of knows it is, so it doesn't really waste your time. It goes from one action set piece to another. Repeat this a couple of times and boom, the movie's basically over before you know it. Alright, now let's talk about this stupid crap in this movie. And trust me, there is a lot. First, Amanda Kirby is terribly acted and is pretty annoying throughout the film. But, and hear me out, she has a better excuse for the decisions she makes than Sarah, because she doesn't really know anything about dinosaurs. And to be fair, some of the stuff she experiences would be horrifying, especially if in her shoes, since most people are just that, normal people. But yeah, she's super annoying. The Alan scene is dumb, and to be honest, they actually could have worked if they simply done it differently. Instead of the raptor talking to him, the scene plays out as it would, where he wakes up and looks around and there's no one on the plane, and when he turns around, a raptor is running up the plane aisle and attacks. That would make for a legitimately terrifying scene, and I think would play a decent role in the kind of explaining Alan's behavior and the ramifications that the first movie had on him. Uh, what kills the boat crew at the beginning of the film? How did the kid survive for 8 weeks? How did he get the T-Rex P? Why is the ending with the Tyrannodons treated like a happy ending when we literally had a whole action scene dedicated to how terrifying they are? I guess the final thing to address in this film is the Spinosaurus vs T-Rex fight. Good freaking lord, I have never seen so much toxicity surrounding a fight since, well, most of the death battles now that I come to think of it. But that's besides the point. If this fight was true to nature, then yes, when the T-Rex chomped down on the Spino's neck, it would have broken it, like a twig. But last I checked, this isn't exactly a real life movie, and the rules of the universe have established it as such. Plus, while this isn't a scientifically accurate Spinosaurus, I think a new big dinosaur was needed in order to keep the franchise from going stale. I mean, do you really want to see the T-Rex be the big scary monster of the franchise again? And yes, I know some of you will probably say that. But hey, if you guys like the same thing over and over again, who am I to stifle on your stale imagination? I think the designs and coloration, especially in this movie, are really solid, with a lot of the dinos having some nice pattern designs, especially in the raptors. But then, all the herbivores look really ugly and kinda terrifying. Honestly, I feel like there's not really that much to say other than this probably is the most boring movie in the series since it's a generic monster action movie that just so happens to have the Jurassic Park name slapped on it. It's not good, but I really don't think it's trying to be, and the fact that it has a lot of production troubles, I'm kind of surprised it turned out as watchable as it did. Well, due to the critical and audience failure of JP3, a fourth movie was cancelled and a wait of 14 years would result until we got our first glimpse at Jurassic World.
To me, Jurassic World is kind of like Jurassic Park 3 if it was more competently made, while having some characters that, while not good, are carried by the actors that play them, which is something that I can't really say for the sequel, which either they forgot to do or they just didn't care enough and didn't feel like it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Look, I'm gonna be honest, I know this film is bad. It continues to misinterpret the themes of the first movie and the book, with the Indominus Rex escaping because some idiot humans went into its cage and then a fat guy opened up its door. And that's the only reason it got out. Same for the dinosaurs in the Lost World, and same for Fallen Kingdom, which kind of defeats the idea of we can't control nature because life finds a way. But hey, who are we to expect the quality of writers who get paid a minimum of $85,000 for one movie on big Hollywood productions? Silly me, I should just take whatever they give me and never expect anything challenging or something resembling good writing. I'll be a good little movie viewer from now on. Anyway, Jurassic World is dumb, and I mean really dumb, but I think it brings a lot of new and interesting concepts, for example, the idea of a hybrid dinosaur. The Indominus Rex is pretty cool, I feel like they make it competent enough to where it's a legit threat and some of the things it does are also pretty cool, like the camouflage and intentionally scaring the Pteranodons and Dimorphodons to get the helicopter out of the sky. I also like the idea with the raptors. The idea of someone imprinting on them, not the use the dinosaurs for war. Trust me, I'll address that little qualm in Fallen Kingdom. I think it's a new way to have them in the story without having them be the exact same thing as the previous movies. And unlike Fallen Kingdom, it doesn't just make them like lassie, and they're still very much a threat, and they aren't just Pokemon that follow every single order at all times. Another cool idea is that the park is operational, and we get to see it in all of its glory, which is unique and makes for a great scene involving the pterosaurs attacking the public. Which is cool because it seems like most of the people that get eaten in these movies are always businessmen or military people, so a change of victim is much appreciated. I guess I should address some controversy that surrounded that scene involving Sara, the nanny, and her death scene, which is honestly pretty awesome. But the director, Colin Trevorrow, was accused of being sexist because of how brutal this scene was. Which I think is stupid, because throughout the movies up until that point, I can't think of any female deaths in any of the previous films. But she was the first and definitely among one of the best deaths in the franchise. Besides, true equality means the good and the bad is given to everyone. So people always say that an ending can make or break a series or film. I think there are plenty of examples showing how important it is to stick the landing. Namely, Game of Thrones and WandaVision are some that come to mind on how a terrible ending can really screw the pooch. But sometimes an ending can save a film. Case in point, Jurassic World. I won't deny that Tyrannosaurus X Machina jokes are well earned, but the inner 5 year old in me was pretty hyped to see the OG T-Rex slowly step out of the dark and break through the Spinosaurus skeleton and start duking that with the Indominus. Which was pretty awesome, and I thought they were actually going to kill the T-Rex and repeat the mistakes of Jurassic Park 3 when Blue comes out and distracts the Indominus long enough for the Rex to smash it into the building. And seeing Blue and Rexy work together and top it off with a Mosasaur KO is just the chef's kiss. The battle is composed of a lot of long, uncut panning shots, and while the dinos may be CGI, I really appreciate these longer uncut shots that aren't just made up of a bajillion jump cuts. And the final shot of Rexy climbing up to the helicopter pad to look over her kingdom couldn't be a more awesome shot to end this movie. I wanted to start off by saying that if you enjoyed this movie, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with liking a big action movie for those selling points. I get that. I really do. I like Godzilla for crying out loud, and most of those movies are pretty stupid. That being said, I think that the first Jurassic Park movie deserves so much better, and it honestly should have ended at the first one, but it was too successful for its own good, just like another series I know. While all the sequels were made to capitalize on the success of the first one, None of them have felt so dirty and shameless about it as Fallen Kingdom. It feels like a very carefully calculated attempt to prey on the nostalgia of fans of the series, and based on box office numbers, I can sadly say it worked.
I haven't watched this movie since it was first released back in 2018, and when I first watched it, I didn't like it then. And I didn't think that was going to change, but I tried to keep an open mind. Off to hang myself, off and left! And I'm gonna be honest, folks. Holy f This is easily one of the worst films I have ever seen, and I've seen a lot of garbage in my life. This is one of those films that legitimately pisses me off in almost every way possible. But since I'm feeling nice, I'll give the movie a few compliments it deserves. Uh, the opening is fine, although the amount of stupidity the one guy has on an island that he knows is full of dinosaurs hurts me. Right, nicest things for this segment. Um, the CGI is better than it was in Jurassic World. And the use of animatronics is a nice way to connect it back to the first film in a way that doesn't feel cheap and manipulative. In semi-defense of one criticism regarding Claire, most people have said that her transformation is way too quick, and I think it definitely should have been shown better in the first film since she clearly had no regards for the animals, period, but seeing a Dinopotosaur suddenly changes that. Maybe it was a traumatic experience and something that, once you experience it in person, it hits much more personally uh, than when you're just told about it. She's still not well written in this movie, but I think that the criticism shouldn't be the main focus for most people, because trust me folks, this movie has plenty of other problems that really should be taking the spotlight in this case. The acting in this film is passable at best, but for the most part, everyone there is poorly acted and really seems like they don't want to be there, especially Chris Pratt. So now, not only do we have these bland and unlikable characters, but they don't even act well for most part of the film. Alright, now let's move on to the bad stuff in the film that didn't make me angry, but still got on my nerves. I'm just gonna rack them off real quick, there's a lot of them here, and I think the other points need to be explained more in depth. Alright. Here. We. Go. The layout of the island all of a sudden is completely different from before. Blue can smell from a mile away, yet can't smell the soldiers with trank guns. The cinematography is either really good or makes the dinosaurs look very small and not impressive. Owen would have received some kind of burns from the lava from being so close. The computer didn't show the baryonyx until the gate was open, but the dinosaurs can be tracked from across the island. The Carno tries to hunt as the volcano is going off. Owen survives being in a pyrocrastic flow, which at minimum would give him a severe third degree burns and can travel at a minimum of 50 miles per hour. Only tenth scene in the movie is the jazz fear sinking scene. How did they capture the T-Rex during the eruption? No one saw them pull that fast and furious move onto the boat. Also a hat is a good enough disguise I guess. Also the dock is completely fat but when they hit it it's like they're going off a ramp. Blood drive at Red Cross does not translate to getting blood from a goddamn dinosaur. No one on the boat hears the T-Rex wake up nor do they suspect anything when its door is open. Also how does research like Owens translate to taking human commands? Velociraptors aren't scary anymore. Blue is just Lassie at this point, or a Pokemon, but she's the only likable character in the movie. Turn yourself in, logic. The holding containment isn't strong enough to hold a sticky moloch, let alone anything bigger with armor, say like a Triceratops or an Ankylosaurus. The auction dealer is slow and boring to missing that zing. Also the dinosaur shouldn't be the price range of a Paul brother or Disney Channel star. Sure is convenient that no one is watching the dinosaurs or the prisoners. Owen is all of a sudden be able to take down a bunch of train guards with little effort. Why didn't the Indoraptor run free into the wild once it was outside? Claire climbed up to the top of the mansion after being stabbed by the Indoraptor. Couldn't they just open the main doors to air out the building with the toxic fumes? That is one big pile of shit. Okay, now I'm in a really bad mood talking about this film. Let's get into the real shit show of this film. So put in some headphones so your parents won't hear Papa Cameron say some very choice words regarding the writing of this film. So buckle up and hold on. The characters in here range from bland to harmless, but some of the most annoying characters I've ever seen. Case in point, Franklin. <laughs> Comedy is one of the most objective things to judge, but as far as I know, not many people are saying this character is the Dave Chappelle of movie characters. The humor at best doesn't have me react that at all, and at its worst, my ears are bleeding from his annoying screaming. <laughs> Next, we have the super cool and badass Zia, who doesn't take crap from anyone, especially no white man. She reminds me of Nick Van Owen from The Lost World, and how all their scenes are constantly reminding you of how much of a badass they are, which kind of has the opposite effect, ironically. It comes off as that one middle schooler that thinks they're tough shit until they get the snot beaten out of them in a fight. Also, you gotta love the logic that she is a paleo veterinarian, but she has never seen a dinosaur, so I assume she has no practical experience with them. And then when we have this poorly shot scene with the Brachiosaurus, she says, Dad, Never thought I'd see one in real life. Um... What? As a person in college who's studying to become a zoologist, why would you choose a field of work in which you'd never be able to get a job in? 
or that you wouldn't think that you'd be able to get a job in. Heck, that's just a practical thing to do in general. If you don't think you'd be able to physically do something in a particular work field, then why would I spend all this money on a useless degree of paper? If I didn't know better, I'd say this sounds like the majority of college students. <laughs> I really couldn't say much about Owen's character other than that he wants to save Blue, I guess, and is also the tough, cool action hero. I'll mention this once here because I know he is capable of acting, but Chris Pratt just did a terrible job in this movie. He doesn't have the charisma of the first Jurassic World, which was enough to carry the character, but not in here, so he could have died and I wouldn't have cared. Claire is kinda there in the movie. I feel like she doesn't really understand why people don't want to save the dinosaurs. It's not because people don't care about them, as she says, but instead, they are uh, not, not, not a part of this uh, world, since their creation and uh, Mother Nature intended for them to go extinct until we meddled with it and decided to play God. Well, since I'm on the topic of Claire, I guess I'll talk about our human antagonist, Eli Mills, who compares himself to Claire and the fact that they both exploited these animals and say that they are the same. Claire, I admire your idealism but we both exploited these animals. At least I have the integrity to admit it. I never, ever did you anything You authorized the creation of the Indominus Rex. You exploited a living thing in a cage for money. How is that different? Yeah, I don't think having animals in a zoo is quite comparable to illegally selling exotic animals on the black market for military purposes. That's not really comparable, but hey, movie has to cheat moral arguments somehow. Speaking of Mills, he has some really stupid moments in this movie, which is kind of an accomplishment. For example, why doesn't he feed Owen and Claire to the dinosaurs? I mean, he even says... Say, so how are we gonna end this? Well, as far as everybody else is concerned, they burned up on the island. So there's no reason why he shouldn't have them killed. It has already been established that he's okay with murder since he killed Lockwood personally just a few scenes ago. But hey, movie has to movie somehow, so I guess we'll just continue to have stupid inconsistent villains because heroes have to hero somehow. And Macy is... well, we'll get to there when we get there, but the actress playing here does a good job, so only problems I have with the character aren't due to her. If anything, I'm probably gonna pronounce this wrong. Isabella Sermon is one of the better actors in this movie, and she actually puts a lot of others to shame which speaks both of her acting quality and how poor all the others do. Heck, I can't even say I like the dinosaur action in this movie since most of it has been done already or doesn't make sense given the context of the film. For example, the T-Rex has just become a plot device at this point. She's whatever or wherever the plot needs her to be at this point. Need our heroes to be saved by Carnotaurus? Boom! T-Rex. Why did the T-Rex attack as the island is exploding? Uh, cause it looks cool. Okay, and I counter with this. If the movie is trying really hard to show me that the dinosaurs are just animals, then why do they constantly act hyper-violent and unanimalistic in scenarios that wouldn't have them act as such? I referenced the Carnotaurus attacking the Sinoceratops while the volcano is once again blowing up. I also referenced the Baryonyx attack and how it has lava drip on its head multiple times and yet still continues to try and eat Franklin and Claire because is it because you want a cheap tension and hope people wouldn't notice? I think it is. Look, if you want mindless horror monsters, then sure, but when a large portion of your movie is dedicated to explaining how these are animals, your point you're trying to make loses its edge when we see quite the opposite from your film. Sorry you have bad writing, just here to point it out, but hey, at least we got a cool action scene. At least the Indominus was strictly portrayed as a bloodthirsty murder machine and not just a misunderstood animal. Velociraptors just also aren't really scary anymore, thanks to Blue. Boo is basically a dog at this point that just protects her master, Daddy Owen. Remember in the first Jurassic World, while Owen could hold all the raptors back, but they were still wild animals, kind of like in real life. No matter how trained an animal is, it's still a wild animal and should be treated as such. But here, she conveniently only eats the bad guys. Side note, but if you have a gun, you fire it from a distance. Shocking PSI, I know, but this guy clearly should have heard it. Well, while we're on the topic of dinosaurs featured in this movie, this movie sure has a bunch of different ones in it. And for some reason, that's enough to excuse piss poor writing. Whoa, it's a Sinoceratops. Whoa, it's a Carnotaurus. Whoa, it's an Allosaurus. Whoa, it's a Baryonyx. If your reaction to this movie is, whoa, this dinosaur is in it, and that's not enough to justify this film being good. You personally can still get enjoyment from this, but it doesn't equate to quality. Yeah, there is a dinosaur antagonist in this film that I could never sadly forget about because of how gosh darn stupid it is. The Indoraptor. I, for the life of me, cannot understand why people like this thing. 
It just looks like the Indominus, which was already pretty Raptor-like, but I feel like it still had a distinct look. So now it's just a slightly different looking Raptor, and they gave it a yellow stripe, which is just a copy design choice from blue, because, I don't know, symbolism or something. This thing is also remarkably inconsistent, with if it wants to be a mindless monster that chases you at full speed, or a cold calculated killer that wants to terrify its victims. Because with an animal like this, you can't have both. This inconsistency is just an excuse to get some horror shots that are nothing more than the superficial cool looking shots with nothing behind them. Also, for being the supposed ultimate weapon for war, this thing is a terrible predator that can't find anything for the life of it. And I know that some of you are thinking right now, But Cameron, the movie said it's a prototype, so of course it can't detect anything from five feet in front of it. You clearly didn't watch the movie. Actually stupid, I did watch it, and they were specifically addressed that aspect of it in the film when Dr. Wu says this. Blue's DNA will be part of the next Indoraptor's makeup, so it will be genetically coded to recognize her authority and assume her traits. Empathy, obedience, everything the prototype you have now is missing. Okay, so how long is this going to be? Empathy, obedience, everything the prototype you have now is missing. Okay. You're a stupid dumbass. <laughs> Clearly I was actually paying attention to the film, so I'll leave that little food for thought with you, dear viewer. In addition to having loosey-goosey senses, this thing sure gets its ass handed to it by Blue in their fight. Heck, it gets launched out of the window by her, so I do not understand why so many people think this dinosaur is way more powerful than it actually is. I know I mentioned this with the Indominus, but if the filmmakers are going to repeat their mistakes, then I'm going to repeat my criticisms. The way the Indoraptor escapes isn't because it's so smart or something, which would help demonstrate the idea that we as humans can't control nature, but instead it gets out because Wheat Toast wanted a tooth from it, and like an idiot went into the cage and left the door unlocked so he could do his tooth fairy shenanigans. Which then leads to the Indoraptor acting like Bugs freaking Bunny. The people the Indoraptor kills in the elevator are because it got lucky and accidentally smacked the buttons with its tail. This could have been a chance for it to do something cool. For example, the writers could have made the Indoraptor slash at the buttons intentionally, but even the people writing this movie can't do that correctly. And don't even get me started on the whole reason why the Indoraptor was created in the first place. It was dumb in the first movie, but the fact that these films still insist that dinosaurs are the next advancement of war is so laughable I'm convinced the writers were high on methamphetamines. Or they're a bunch of five-year-olds, which is a very real possibility given the writing. In the film, they mention that animals have been used for warfare all the time, and the two examples they mentioned were rats and elephants. What? What the fuck? Why do you suppose I just hurled a chair at your head? Diseased rats are not comparable to freaking dinosaurs. And funny you should mention it, movie, because elephants being used for war hasn't been done since 1987. And even then, it was mostly used to transport supplies. But newsflash, they aren't exactly the most useful in war anymore because tanks, guns, aircrafts, and drones exist. I'd like to reference Muller and his statements regarding this idea and rattle off the points. They would be shit in a war. They're massive targets. They require a lot of food and resources to stay alive. They can't distinguish between civilians and enemies. Even if you could prevent them from attacking your own soldiers, they are made ineffective by modern technology and weapons. They would be shit in a war. Also, the glorified laser pointer doesn't make any sense either. Because if I'm going to point a gun at someone, why don't I just... And here's a crazy idea, folks. But why don't I just shoot them with a normal bullet? Especially since the Indoraptor has been shown to scream as loud as it can once the button is pushed. Also, some say that bullets are loud because dinosaurs are very quiet. Triggers the attack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this movie's terrible. Okay, I have one more thing to discuss for this godforsaken movie, and that's Maisie. Because good lord, the decision involving her is insane. First off, why was she a clone? What's the point behind that? Why did Eli Mills tell Owen and Claire? And then there's the scene, where Claire is about to release the dinosaurs to keep them from dying to the poisonous fumes. But in a mature adult decision, she chooses not to release the dinosaurs. And that wild tragic shows that sometimes the best thing to do isn't always the easiest. I had to. There are 
life like me. Fuck you. So she basically just opened the doors to a maximum security prison. The argument that they're alive is a terrible justification to do that. The same argument could be used for any living organism, including people that have committed horrible actions. And as a nostalgia critic put it, They're uh, about to kill a lot of little kids like you too. Dumbass. I'm so tired of this movie. So you can just use your last two brain cells to explain why this is a terrible justification to release a bunch of invasive, dangerous animals near a populated area. Regardless, any deaths in the third movie are on this little psychopath's hands. The ending shot with her actually reminds me of this quote from Rob Zombie's Halloween. These are the eyes of a psychopath. She should be charged with all the charges, and the fact that no one tackles her is very concerning, so throw some charges on them too. Okay, so I got through this movie, so now I'm done talking about it, right? <laughs> Not yet. Look, if this was just a bad movie with bad writing, acting, etc., that would be one thing. But the fact that this film really preys on people's nostalgia and the fact that this movie was essentially just a trailer for Jurassic World Dominion is what really rubs me the wrong way. So let's look at some of the examples used. First off, the references to past films. Ian Malcolm was in the movie to give trailer lines. He served no purpose to the story of this film, so why was he in here? Oh yeah, so people could go, Whoa, it's me and Malcolm! Ah! Rexy doing the exact same pose as she did in the first movie after eating Mills. Logically, why would she do that exact pose? In the first film, it's because she was inside the visitor center, so she was constrained by the space. But here, there's no reason for her to do that pose except to make brain-dead fans cream their pants. I think the worst example of this, however, is the Brachiosaurus on the dock scene. This might have been one of the laziest, cheapest, dirtiest moves I've seen a film pull in order to try and make people feel something. And of course, they make it do the exact same pose as it did in the first movie because we have to remind the viewers of the first movie. The first film had so many different lines of dialogue that are a great metaphor for how this franchise has been used to squeeze every drop from this cash cow's teat. But I think the ash of the volcano swallowing up and choking the life out of the Brachiosaurus might be the perfect metaphor for how every single one of these films has desecrated the first one. Then again, the reflection shot of money going up in Eli's glasses is also a very appropriate metaphor for the creation of this film. The cheap attempts to tie this into the first movie, like this was planned from the beginning, is absolutely laughable. Like Benjamin Lockwood always being Hammond's partner, wink wink, piss off movie. That's just your lazy attempt to once again try and reconnect back to the first film. The first half of this movie is basically just the plot of The Lost World. Which I'm so glad that of all the movies they decided to copy from this franchise, they decided to remind me of that one. And the fact that this movie has the BALLS to play the original Jurassic Park theme during the end credits. I have never felt so dirty while listening to a movie score play, but by Joe, life found a f way. Then again, I guess this is the state that all movies are in nowadays. The fact that idiots like me and everyone else goes to see these movies is only encouraging Hollywood to continue this behavior, and I guarantee it's only going to get worse. If a franchise was created before 2005, you can bet the industry will retrieve its corpse to squeeze any kind of money they can from it. Whatever happened to endings, can't franchises just rest without having to do a complete shot for shot remake of the original film or sequel that came 20 years too late? And you know what, I think that as long as we keep going to see these movies, we deserve to have this crap dumped on us. Whatever garbage that Hollywood continues to dump on us in their self-righteous, pompous, pretentious, hypocritical bullshit of a mission. Look, if you want to do a sequel to a beloved series, go ahead, as long as you have a story to tell. But the problem is, is that these writers, directors, and producers don't. The only story they have to tell is the one of how they became rich from suckers like us. Honestly, my only hope in this industry is that good original shows and movies like Encanto, Arcane, Invincible, and The Boys are being made, so hopefully these pieces of media can continue to grow in popularity. Then maybe writers can get their heads out of their own asses and start writing quality stories with likable characters instead of indulging in their self-delusioned, entitled missions. I rip on the sequels because the first film is so great, and when you look at the backstory behind the production of this film, it's really not fair that the people who took some really big risks at the time are used to prop up the laziness of filmmakers of today. 
Could Dominion be good? It's 2022. Anything's possible. Do I think it will be? <clears throat> no. Will it be better than Fallen Kingdom? God, I hope so, but it's not like it actually has to be good. It just has to be better than the crap fest. What more can I say than to end with this quote by Ian Malcolm himself? If I may, um, I'll tell you the problem with the scientific power that you're, that you're using here. Uh, it didn't require any discipline to attain it. You know, you read what others had done, and you, and you took the next step. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves, so you don't take any responsibility for it. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and before you even knew what you had, you, you patented it and packaged it and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now you're selling it. You want to sell it.